A fresh bowl of rice has pleasant color and fragrance. Master Yunmin's samadhi is in every atom. You should never waste a single grain. Turn both the Dharma wheel and the wheel of food with excellence. When I was a young adult, my family was a liberal Protestant, but very observant. We went to church every week, and we picked up people to take to church, and my parents taught Sunday school, and we all sang in the choir and so on. But I sat, as I sat in the pews, I really found the teachings pretty opaque. I was constantly having to translate in my mind. Well, when they talk about God, they don't mean a guy up there with a beard and white hair and angels flying around a throne. What, what, what do they mean when they're talking about God that I can relate to? And I really wasn't satisfied um, because I understood that it was possible to feel God's presence. People would talk about feeling God's presence in their life um, or consulting with God. So I could, I, could, I could feel that that was possible. It was like there was a thin curtain and it was so close on the other side of this curtain. And then when I encountered Zen and began reading Zen books or hearing Zen teachers talking about awakening as a practice that provided a, a way to lift that curtain and to have the experience of the divine, of the great mystery ourselves, it was very exciting for me. And that uh, experience was described as being available to everyone without exception because it was our original nature. It was our birthright, everyone's birthright. But we had become confused in life. So that's a beautiful analogy to mindful eating because we know from an experiment that I described that was done uh, in the 1930s that children are intuitive eaters. Children are mindful eaters by nature if they're provided with a variety of healthy food. They will eat exactly the right amount of calories and balanced nutrition and thrive. But what happens is we interfere because of our anxiety, right? So um, I remember once when our oldest our oldest son was, I think, about a year and a half, maybe, yeah, a year and a half, I think. And um, he was learning to eat by himself with a spoon, and I gave him a cup. I remember exactly where this happened, because it was kind of a revelation about me. Um, I gave him a cup of yogurt, and he was eating the yogurt with a spoon and really enjoying it. It was like he was on a, he had the cup was on a, a wooden cart, and he was standing up and eating with relish and getting it on his face, you know, and his hair. And I thought, hmm, I wonder if that's enough. So I added some applesauce to the yogurt. So he liked that. He liked the applesauce, kind of sweet, mixed in the yogurt. So he ate that. Then I thought, I don't think this is enough protein. So I added wheat germ. <laughs> and then he wouldn't eat it. <laughs> but that's the, an example of the anxiety that we get about the people we care about. And it actually comes from love and a desire for them to be healthy and succeed in life. But love, love, when love turns into anxiety, it's no longer perceived as love. It's perceived as anxiety and pushing. And then there's a pushback, right? Like, don't do that to me. I was having a good time and you messed it up. <laughs> so realizing that maybe uh, because the things I read about in Zen practice made sense to me um, in a very deep way. I signed up for a week-long retreat, silent retreat at ZCLA. And in the first night, we, we got very detailed instructions in Oriyoki. So in this retreat, for those who ate for the first time, ate an Oriyoki meal, you did beautifully. Um, but it's a very, actually, as you learn more and more details about it, it's a fairly elaborate ritual designed to keep you mindful of exactly how you place this and exactly how you turn this and how exactly how you get your utensils out of the bag quietly and so on. So we had uh, very detailed instructions. And in the week that followed, um, 
I decided I was going to eat as mindfully as I could, every bite if possible. And one day I was swallowing some juice and I traced it, its path down, trying to be aware of it going down the esophagus. Sometimes if it's cold, you can feel that, right? Something cold going down your esophagus. And then into my stomach, more subtle. And then you, know, you begin to use imagination or visualization visualizing it going through my bloodstream to the cells in my body. And then I wondered, when did the juice become me? Or when did I become the juice? Like, what was going on there in that interface? And suddenly I was overwhelmed by this continuous experience of, of coming into union with everything that I was taking in coming into union and it becoming me and me becoming it. And I realized that this was the meaning of communion, that it had always been in a kind of opaque mystery to me uh, in all my years in the church. What, what, what was communion? But suddenly it was a, a, a vivid and, live, and lived experience, um, hidden, hidden in plain sight, you know? It had been talked about all my life, um, but somehow it, I just didn't get it until I had the experience myself. Rather than just reading about it in the scriptures or hearing about it in a sermon. And this is what Zen practice is based on. Based, Zen practice is based on true experience. Your own personal experience. And so you're not asked to believe something just because the preacher said it or it's in the Bible or it's in the creed. Apostles' Creed or whatever, you're asked to try it and find out for yourself what the experience is. Because when we have the actual experience, then it's not a matter of belief anymore. It's a matter of, I actually experienced this. So it's, for me, it's true. So that's when I began uh, practicing mindful eating and doing... Um, Inventing little exercises for myself. So the exercises in the Mindful Eating book and some of the things that we did this workshop, I invented all of those over the last, what, 45 years as a way to keep my interest in mindful eating and make more discoveries. Um, I was part of a um, Christian Buddhist dialogue for a number of years. And we had, well, there were about 15 people on the Christian side, all of them uh, ordained, but some were just local parish priests and there was the bishop, became the bishop of um, Salt Lake City eventually, and there were some Jesuit uh, academics too. And we were doing an exchange of talking about things like saints and bodhisattvas and comparing and contrasting saints and bodhisattvas. And, and you know, after we got acquainted with each other, we could dare to ask the question like, so how many angels do fit on the head of a pin? Like, <laughs> tell me about this. <laughs> we began to be able to tease each other or something, you know. But um, as we were exchanging uh, various practices, so we always had mass every day, and we always had zazen every day. So we opened and closed the door with, uh, opened and closed the days with those shared rituals. And, um, so I offered uh, the exercise that you did, the eating one raisin mindfully. And I've done that exercise probably a hundred times. And it's always new to me. It's always interesting to me. And if we can approach life like that, so nothing is boring, nothing is blasé. We're not blasé about anything. We're always interested in this is a new moment and this is a new experience. And I'm a different person than I was an hour ago or a year ago then life becomes so much more fulfilling. So I offered this uh, single raisin exercise. And afterwards, one of the people who did it with me, uh, who was a Jesuit priest, came up to me. And he tried to describe his experience of eating this single raisin. He said it just flooded his mouth with sensation and his entire being with joy. And he's, he, was, he was actually had tears in his eyes and he said, this is how communion has always been for, for me since my first communion. 
So he had a kind of mystical experience with his first communion, and that's part of the reason he became a priest. He said it, that it's an amazing mystery to him how one small bit of food so it was so full of many flavors and subtleties and so completely satisfying. How can one small be, bit of food be completely satisfying? So maybe in the mindful eating workshop or as you eat mindfully, you would have that experience. In fact, is, is Jindo? Yeah, Jindo. Do you want to describe your experience with the, the pre-dried um, version? Yes. For those of you who were here, I just it all culminated this morning with enjoying a single grape and being present with that, no more, no less. And I felt it. I tried to do a chosen. I take a lot of uh, example from that, the following of the food through the body. And as I followed it through my body, my body began to tingle a little bit. And so that was nice. <laughs> And the, the exercise that we were doing was to trace the origin of this one piece of fruit that you took out of your bowl and just trace it back through how did it come to you? How many people, human beings, life energy was involved in getting it to you? And how many other beings, life energy was involved in getting it to you? And ultimately back to the sun and the earth and, and the rain. And you realize, I mean, even with a grape, you know, grapes came to us from Europe, cultivated grapes. So how far back do you go? To the Mediterranean, where we think cultivation of grapes originated? And then, and then if you add in, you know, who, pack, who designed the package for the grapes that they come in in the store, and so on, and you go laterally, it's, it's, it's literally hundreds of thousands of people and beings. Life energy is flowing towards you in one grape. And then you realize the truth of what Thich Nhat Hanh always talked about, which is interbeing, that we really inter are. I used to have a practice, you know, we, when we pass each other on the sidewalks here, we, bow, we stop and we bow to each other to acknowledge the presence of this person in our life. And I used to silently say, I'm glad you're in my life, as I did that. Or you can send loving kindness. There are lots of things you can do to keep yourself aware and not have it be automatic. So I used to silently say, I'm glad you're in my life. But the more I have this experience of interbeing, I changed it to, I'm glad you are my life. Because right now, this is my life. All of you are my life. I have no other life. All the rest of my life is like fantasy. Yes, I have children, but you know, they're not here. And maybe they all disappeared. I don't know. Probably not, but could be. <laughs> we don't know. So to live the reality that we're actually living, rather than in the future and the past and fantasies, is to really be alive. And so my life is all of you in this room, including the emptiness, the empty space in this room. And it includes, you know, last night it included the owl and the coyotes. And, you know, it gets bigger and bigger the more you include your life. So how have we lost the sacred aspect of eating? How have we lost the sacred aspect of eating? Eating is truly a sacred activity. How have we developed the habits of eating as fast as possible in order to get it over with? or of even feeling conflicted emotions and fear and anxiety when we sit down to eat? How have we developed the habit of always distracting ourselves during eating by reading or by texting or by watching the news or a TV show? Why is it so hard to sit down and just eat? What is going on here? When we first began teaching mindful eating to professionals in Europe, we, uh, my teaching partner and I, who's, she's an American, and uh, we planned a, an American conference schedule where you cram as much information into the day as possible. You know, these are professionals. It's hard for them to take the time out of their life. They're paying for it. So we're just like in a, it's like pate de foie gras. You know, it's like stuff information down their throats. 
So we're in Europe um, and we finish, it's dinner time, we finished a, a day of teaching, part of a day of teaching. And at dinner time, we announced that everybody was to return to continue the training from 7.30 to 9.30 p.m. And people looked shocked. And they went to our hostess, our sponsor, and she came to us. And she, you know, very politely took us aside and said, in European countries, when you finish work, it's time to relax. And it's time to eat, implication, mindfully, <laughs> with your friends and have a little wine. And so uh, could we revise the schedule? <laughs> so we had to revise our schedule and end the training at, at 6 p.m. And then we learned to relax about not being able to cram in all the important ideas that we had stuffed into this syllabus, um, which we thought was very important, right? So in different parts of the world, there are very different ways of eating. And there's a parallel here. If we, go, can, if we go to a buffet, can we relax about not being able to eat everything or sample everything? If we're eating mindfully and we realize that we're now full and satisfied, but there's still full on the plate, food on the plate and we grew up with the clean your plate rule, can we relax about putting it into the compost to become new life or putting it aside to eat later when hunger appears again? Or more significantly, can we relax about returning to all of the elements of our body back to the earth so that new life has all the necessary building blocks to become new life and grow and flourish? Can we, with grace, return the carbon and the magnesium and the iron in our body back so that it can grow new life? These elements were, of course, gifted to us and can we pass them on gracefully when the time comes? That is a really big challenge. That is a really big challenge. And especially as we come through practice to enjoy life more and more, then we want to cling to it, right? Oh, just a few more years. One of my father's favorite hymns was, Oh, let me stay a little longer. There, I've got so many things to do. It's a, like Southern Gospel hymn. But it's true. You know, let me stay a little longer, please. It's a big challenge. So there's an important distinction that we didn't talk about in the Mindful Eating Workshop, which is the distinction between fullness and satisfaction. Fullness and satisfaction are different, as the communion example uh, demonstrates, right? This priest was fully satisfied with a little tiny communion wafer. But was he full? No. So fullness is a physical phenomenon. Satisfaction is an emotional experience or a full, full person experience, like Jindo described. There was satisfaction in the experience of this one grape. To our heart, to our hunger for experiencing the great mystery, one communion wafer or one grape can be completely satisfying if we're really, really present. And in my fleeting, I talk about nine different aspects of hunger, and one of them is heart hunger. That's our heart's deepest desire, as Hogan talks about it. Our heart's deepest desire. So how can that be satisfied? It's really a spiritual longing. And it's satisfied by presence. So mindfulness has become kind of trivial these days. Everything's labeled as mindful this and mindful that. But it's, it's, an, it's a, a, an essential aspect of our practice. So right now, just bring mindfulness to your fingers and just move them across the surface that they're touching, just gently. Just be aware of that 
texture. And maybe reach out if you've got the floor next to you and touch the floor and do the same thing. Just gently caress the floor. It's a different experience. And yet we go through most of our life not appreciating that experience of, of simple touch. Or the constant caress of our clothes. If we expand it to feeling the constant caress of our clothing. Every time we breathe, it shifts and it's gently caressing our body. Kind of a constant massage. So there's one of the aspects of hunger is touch hunger. And we do long to be touched. We're creatures who, who long to be touched. And um, I realized that when my grandmother in her uh, late 80s would, would go to a chiropractor. And, and my mom said, you know, the reason she goes to a chiropractor is she's living alone. And she needs to be touched. And the chiropractic treatment is providing that for her because she doesn't have anybody in the house and hasn't for decades um, to touch or to be touched by. But when we really enter mindful awareness, we realize we're being touched all the time. It's just maybe not by the object of our desire, you know, the person we want to touch us, but everything is constantly touching us and caressing us. It's really um, very, as somebody said when they first did mindful eating, they said, this is overwhelmingly sensual. This is really scary. So that's an aspect too. Why do we back off from these sensual experiences like being, you know, caressing or caressing ourselves? You know, one, one practice I recommend in mindful medicine is that people look in the mirror and touch themselves with kindness like you would you know, a beloved child or your beloved partner. Like this. Look at yourself. Oh, how sweet. Mm -hmm. But that's hard for people to do. It's hard to remember. We can remember to touch other people if we do massage therapy or chiropractic with presence in our hands. But then maybe we don't, rec we don't do it for ourselves. Is Taito here? He's in the back. Oh, he's in the back. Taito, can you hear me? If so, come out. Come out, come out, wherever you are. <laughs> Would you be willing to tell people about how your mom knows when you've got a new girlfriend? <laughs> Well, I didn't eat food because I felt good. And you felt good. satisfied. See, that's the distinction. You felt satisfied because your heart's hunger was satisfied, right? Your heart, your heart was full. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhat. Yes. Thank you. So I thought that was a beautiful little demonstration of of how when the heart is fed, then often our desire for food just can evaporate for a while, where especially when we're in the like glimmerance phase of falling in love, you know. Yeah. So fullness is a physical feeling, bordering on discomfort if our stomach is stretched too far. And if people chronically overeat, they lose that feeling of stretch, and they they have trouble gauging fullness, and have I eaten the right amount? for my body or my stomach. But that um, knowledge, that awareness can be regained. Sometimes in a few days, if you just keep practicing it, asking your stomach how full it is and how much volume it would like. In mindful eating, we learn to gauge that fullness or relearn to gauge that fullness and to stop before discomfort sets in. Now, we're not always perfect. Perfection is boring. Perfection is static. And as I always say, who wants to be partnered or married to somebody who's perfect? 
That would be awful. Or have a friend who's perfect. That would be awful. So sometimes we aren't that alert or accurate, and sometimes we end a meal feeling overfull. And we learn from that. We don't let the inner critic come in and beat us up about it. It's just like, oh, I didn't gauge it quite right. That's okay. So we learn that mindful eating is not arriving at perfection and remaining in that frozen place for the rest of our life while our, while our body is changing. The seasons are changing. And when it's colder, I've noticed when, it, when it's colder, I'm hungrier. Then as we've had this changing weather the last few months, it's been very easy to see. When it gets hot, I lose my appetite. When it gets cold again, I get hungry again. And I always put on a few pounds. And then in the summertime, it disappears. So the, we're, we're a dynamic system. Our ability to smell and taste changes. Everything is changing. This is the law of impermanence. Impermanence is real. And we have a much happier life if we learn to flow with it rather than resisting it. And to learn to to adjust, to continually investigate and adjust, is at first more difficult than following fixed rules. So I mentioned in the Mindful Eating Workshop that in teaching in Europe, eventually, you know, after the, like two days, somebody would raise their hand and say, well, is there a rule about that? And, you know, we would laugh and say, no, no, this is not about rules. This is about experience. So, At first, that's more difficult than following the rules. The fixed rules, like never eat white things, or never eat animal things, or never eat after 8 p.m. at night, or whatever. There's just always rules, and the rules are always changing. I've lived long enough to see the rules are always changing, and I gave you examples of the rules about butter, right? (laughs) Is butter good or bad, or eggs good or bad? It's always changing. So the wisdom is here. We just have to learn to access it. And letting go of rules can be hard at first, especially if we relied on them for years. But when we switch from rules to curiosity and investigation and discovery, then life becomes so much more interesting. Then we align with what life really is, which is dynamic. You know, if things get frozen, and don't change, that means they're dead. The definition of life is that things are constantly changing and growing. Essential to life and essential to a happy life is aligning ourselves with those changes and adjusting to those changes. So I want to do a very brief um, guided meditation We did part of this during the retreat. So we're going to um, take the light of our awareness and move it to different body parts. So that's called a body scan. And it develops the the flexibility, our flexibility of mind to move our awareness to different, different things, which is really important in practice. So first, if you would, you can have eyes closed or partly closed or all the way closed, whatever helps you become aware of this entire body that sits and breathes. So especially if you can't see it, how do you know that there is a body that sits and breathes? What are the constellation of sensations that you call my body? So we often suggest temperature. There are areas in this field of sensation that you call my body that are cooler or warmer. Or you might be aware of the change of temperature in the inhaled breath and the exhaled breath at the nostrils. And then all the sensations of touch, in a body that's sitting and breathing, some areas of 
strong, what we might call pressure, series of movements that we link together in our awareness and call movement. It's really just touch, 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 but we call it movement. So now, if you would take the light of awareness and move it to your tongue. So if you can't see your tongue, how do you know you have a tongue? What are the sensations that you stitch together and call my tongue? So there might be uh, sensations of movement. There might be sensations of moisture or dryness. Possibly sensations of taste. Even if you haven't eaten recently, there might be sensations of taste. And then all the things that the tongue touches. So there could be sensations we call teeth, maybe smooth, call them teeth, and then sensations if we run our tongue over the roof of our mouth, all those little corrugations that the tongue can detect. So do those sensations that we call teeth and roof of the mouth, are they part of the tongue? Like if the tongue had no sensations, would, would we be where we had a tongue? So the sensation of, that we describe as my tongue depends on other sensations, right? That's interbeing again. So now before we leave the tongue, if you would say, thank you, tongue, for, and leave a blank spot. See if anything arises in that blank spot or not. Thank you, tongue, for... Now move the light of your awareness to your feet. (coughs) And notice there are sensations that we call the top of my foot, and then there are sensations we call the bottom of my foot. Where are there more sensations? And perhaps there are sensations we call my big toe or my little toe. or even my arch. But they're really just groups of sensations. And if you wiggle your foot, those sensations change. So did your foot change? If those sensations change? Perception of foot changes. But we somehow glue it all together and call it my foot. So before you leave awareness of your feet, Silently say, thank you, feed for, see if anything arises, or not. Thank you, feed for. If you're, you know, if you play soccer or you swim, you've got some Old categories there to thank your feet for. So now if you would um, pick up your light of awareness and move it to, to your body fat. How do you know you have body fat? What are the sensations that you put together and call body fat? Are there sensations of touch or movement or warmth, coolness? If you can't see it, how do you know that you have body fat? And now thank you body fat for, and see if anything arises in that blank space. Thank you body fat for
Stay with it. See if there's anything there. Okay, now just open your awareness again to the entire body that's sitting and breathing. And then gradually let your eyes open if they were closed. Open your awareness to the entire room. So what did you discover when we moved our awareness to body fat? Anybody? Did you did anything arise in the thank you body fat for? Keeping you keeping you warm. Keeping you warm. And protection. Protection from cold. Mm-hmm. So keeping you warm and protecting you from freezing to death. Yeah. And you're a you swim in rivers, so you have that experience of I need some insulation here so I can do this thing that I really enjoy. Yeah. So insulation is essential. And protection, actually, there's an element of protection from physical harm, too. So, you know, getting bruised or bumped. We need some padding for that. Cindy, did you have something else? Mm. When I go through periods of distress and I'm consuming a heating mask, mm-hmm. they're a great buffer. Yes, it's a storehouse. And the scientists are now beginning, just as they realize that the microbiome is this living dynamic system that affects our physical and mental health, they're now looking at fat as an organ, an organ by itself. Because it stores a lot of things, including hormones, and then releases them. And it, it's much, you know, we kind of think of things as inert. It's not inert. It's very active. And so how would it be to hug somebody who had no fat? Or to have sex with somebody who had no fat? Just think about that. Yeah, there are lots. There are many more. I'm just, you, you just touched a few benefits of having body fat. You'll, in a cold climate, you survive. And if you're a woman and you're nursing children, they'll survive too, because that fat store can be mobilized and turned into breast milk, and then your kids can survive. And there, uh, I didn't have time to show this, but I can send people the link if they want to. There are people born without body fat. And there are several YouTubes about a, a man and a a young woman who have no body fat, and what their life is like. They have to eat every 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, otherwise their energy level just crashes. Because they can't store, they have no long-term storage. Every 20 or 30 minutes, yeah. So it's, for some people, it's hard to be grateful for body fat, but once you learn what it's actually doing, you Gratitude arises. And that is what practice uncovers for us, is gratitude for everything that contributes to our life. So I'm very grateful for all of you. And I hope you keep on practicing and open completely to the beauty of your original nature. Thank you.